Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with Moss Pawn and Gun. Today we have a very unique video for you. I've got Scott Moore with Whack Outdoors here with us today. He's a wilderness and survival expert as well as an expert on primitive weapons and we thought it would be fun since he has all his equipment here. He uh, took time out of his busy schedule to come down here and show some stuff off to show you guys a breakdown of primitive weaponry, uh, how the weaponry's progressed through the ages, what we have today to work with, and really, you know, I know this is a gun channel, but firearms developed out of necessity as technology increased. And, you know, to call a weapon a primitive weapon, it's not saying that the people that made these weapons were crude or dumb or, you know, an unintelligent in any way. Correct. It's just that this represents the apex of the technology they had at their disposal. So early on, Scott, uh, you know, if, if you were a group of, I don't know, indigenous Americans or, or whatever, if you're a group of Indians and you needed to take down a big critter, what would people have likely, uh, you know, gone for first to do that? I think it's safe to assume that the first weapon used was a club that advanced to a sharp stick that was used as a thrusting weapon, like a lance, Okay. for, for an example. To, so to keep the threat as far away from you, because right. I, I think it's a natural tendency for us as human beings to want to wanna keep things away from us that right. are dangerous, and create, part of that is to have that space. Create distance and, and force protection. Yep, so that Absolutely. would be done through a spear. Yes. All right, so we got a cold steel uh, boar spear. Now this is a modern spear, um, but it's more of a you know throwing spear, so to speak. But uh, your son has actually killed hogs with this very spear. Yeah, this is this is a leap. We're starting talking about primitive with a, a modern cold steel Samburu spear. But yes, uh, it's getting more popular these days because modern technology has allowed people to become so successful as hunters. It's kind of a natural progression as your skill increases to bring about limitation through equipment choice uh, to increase your enjoyment and the challenge. And sure. we have gotten clear full circle to where uh, spears are very popular today. And these have proven to be very effective weapons against the boars we're hunting. Absolutely. So, so spears in, in various forms, you know, th there are, you know, so many archeological examples of different spears and, and, and those types of weapons that have been found over the years and all over the world, okay? Uh, so this is just one example of a spear. I mean, spears are, are really represent the most modern form. So creating that distance with a spear, uh, eventually in indigenous peoples or, you know, whoever were using these, you know, back in the early parts of, I guess, human civilization. I mean, these, these technologies are very old. They wanted to have a way to not only have that, that distance, but then hurl the spear, Correct. throw the spear. So Absolutely. you've got an atlatl here. Now this yes. is something I'm newly familiar with. But right, tell us and, about that. and the atlatl is a weapon that like so many of these weapons, different people in different parts of the world, independent of each other, develop the same weapon system. And I'm so appreciative of the fact that as we said, primitive doesn't mean unintelligent, crude. Primitive means first, the human intellect has always been in full force and men with the materials made available to them have always engineered very effective weapons. And a spear as a throwing implement, I'm sure was used first. In the advent of the atlatl, you're basically taking a cocking lever and using that leverage to increase the force to hurl the spear. And this is just one example. This is not even necessarily a real historically accurate atlatl, but it's indicative of uh, what the basket makers used in the, uh, in the Southwest. And what this very simply does is this has a trough plowed out of here and a point that will catch on the back of the atlatl dart, which has a divot in it. So what I'm gonna do is when I grab this atlatl and hold it, the back of this atlatl goes in the trough and the divot goes in the point. And when this is thrown this way, it creates a tremendous amount of leverage to propel the dart. And by the way, technically speaking, 
a spear when used with an atlatl system is a dart. A dart, a and dart. Not a spear, and Typically, not a spear. we'll say five to seven feet long, average. And excellent. That's so where that's your atlatl kind of right. in a nutshell, guys. So the interesting <clears throat> thing also that I want to mention for this video is that a lot of these things you're going to see here, Scott made. Okay, so he's also an expert in kind of taking some of these bushcraft ideas and some of these traditional ideas that the Indians originally developed and sort of making them his own and, and improvising and coming up with some fun uh, and many times historically accurate, uh, you know, versions of this weapon. So, Correct. you know, once the atlatl kind of came to be and, and they figured that there were certain limitations uh, involved in that, uh, the art of bow making kind of started to develop and we're not going to necessarily give dates because it's such a long time ago there's probably going to be a varying amount of uh, accuracy historically that we have to go on and not to mention differing opinions on when sure. the first bows were really out there but speaking from the standpoint of uh, American Indians or just you know Indians that were present on the American continent uh, you know a just traditional bow like this you actually made this particular bow. correct Tell us a little bit about this setup. Uh, this bow is made out of Osage orange. Uh, the, the style or the design of the bow, uh, for you guys that are bow buffs and know, this is a decent representation of the Mere Heath bow, which is one of the oldest bows. It was found in a peat bog over in Europe. And, uh, you know, we, we discussed the fact that different people in different parts of the world with no connection with each other made very similar weapons because through trial and error, they made what worked and what works, works anywhere. And without going into great detail, uh, what makes this bow work is that the limb is quite a bit wider than it is deep, which allows it to bend without breaking. And it is uh, an overbuilt bow, which means it's longer than it needs to be and wider than it needs to be, which ensures that it's not gonna break which was very typically seen throughout history. It, uh, not necessarily the most efficient, but the most sure that your hard earned time spent collecting the proper material and making a weapon, it was gonna have longevity as a weapon for you. It's very interesting to think about bows, you know, because what we look at in the gun world, you know, I'm kind of a gun person primarily, and, and when I think about guns, I think, okay, well, taking a projectile and getting it from point A to point B, archery is its own animal. It, it, it's, it's a very unique art form, guys, and some of you that are watching this are going, well, yeah, I go and I pop Bambi every uh, year in the woods with my, uh, with my compound bow. Correct. But there's a certain special art that goes into using, you know, a recurve or, or a long bow or a traditional style bow, when I think bow hunting, I think this style of bow. And I would like to think that most people, when they think bow, that's what they think, a traditional long bow or recurve style bow um, that just gives you that, you know, you gotta really just have a lot of practice with it to shoot Correct. it well. You know, it's, I guess, traditionally, probably easier to shoot something like a modern compound bow good oh, yes. with is less practice than it would be to actually hit your target Absolutely. with this. And, and, I, and I will tell you, I have hunted with compound bows. I've shot competitively with compound bows. I would never say anything disparaging about the compound bow as a weapon. We live in a society today where we have a lot of leisure time. And I think it just lends to men wanting to harken back to the days of old, get nostalgic about what they're doing, sure. and going back to the old way of doing things has a lot of appeal. For a lot of people you know and it's interesting that you mentioned going back to the old ways because i think that what we're seeing in our in our sort of modern society we live in is that more people are becoming more and more willing to put down the iphones and the ipads and and put down the tv remote and realize that a lot of those traditional values are, are getting lost in our modern world and they're trying to and kind of embrace that. And that's really the spirit of this video is I want people to, if they weren't thinking about messing around with some of this stuff in addition to their normal firearms uh, regimen, I mean, I, I've, I've been kind of awakened up, you know, a good bit about it just from spending some time with Scott over the last year and checking out the stuff he has going on. So, you know, not to get far off subject, but with your bow, you know, you've also got an arrow that it fires. I think most people understand that, you know, a bow fires an arrow, but Correct. arrows in their own right have evolved quite a bit over the years as well. So Absolutely. what were some of the early arrow types? Well, I tell you what, this would be an example of a real early arrow. This is just a stick. 
and the knock on the end is created to grab with your thumb and forefinger in what's known as a pinch grip. And there's actually a deer sinew and high glue wrapped around the end to make a bulbous bludgeon point for small game. Just knock a, just, a squirrel right, out and or just, a whatever. Just, just a, a stick that you can grip it and rip it, basically. Cool. Is what we had. And it goes from there to starting to create finer stone points and hafting those with the deer sinew and the hide glue and splitting your fletching and adhering that with the sinew and actually putting the spiral twist on it and the three fletch for stability, accuracy, and it just progresses up through the ages. So with this system here and uh, you know just so some of the viewers that aren't familiar with it, with an arrow you have fletching that's on the arrow and that, that fletching and correct me if I'm wrong that's going to impart some spin and stability right better accuracy correct more consistency and, and from the arrow biggest arrow. thing is when the arrow is launched from the bow we want it to fly straight and and despite the spin we all just we want the fins in the back to straighten up the shaft so the flight is true okay that's very interesting and this particular uh, shaft of this arrow is made out of a piece of bamboo Piece of cane, a river cane. cane. Okay, mm -hmm. river cane, which uh, really is is not. I'm surprised it's not as strong as I would think. Like it, it does have some inherent strength, but you know I can see where you know this arrow actually is pretty lightweight. Mm -hmm. So wh where does that correlation you know go between say a heavy arrow you're launching versus a lightweight arrow? Right. I mean in the firearms world, you know we've got light bullets we can shoot, we've got heavy bullets. How does that correlate uh, related to arrows? I mean in terms of arrow weight. Same thing, and this is a very detailed discussion. We're not going to get into. Uh, we'll we'll create a, a debate and 500 comments on your channel <laughs> about discrepancy. But when you're talking about a projectile's weight and velocity and start talking about kinetic energy. When you're dealing with primitive weapons, you don't have the velocity. So you need to bring in mass weight to create the momentum to pile that projectile through the intended quarry. And of course that all comes down to the draw weight on the bow, the strength of the bow, the length of the arrow, the weight of the arrow, all of those things obviously Correct. are going to transfer to varying amounts of kinetic energy downrange. So. Right, and I'll give you a point of reference, the guys we're late sure. to. You're shooting a Matthews compound bow and you're shooting a 65 pound bow and you're shooting a 400 grain arrow, you got velocity, you're whipping that through your game animal. When I'm shooting these primitive bows and my arrows are flying 150 feet per second, which is slow, I can make up for that with the mass weight of my shaft, which is going to weigh about 600 grains, to ensure that when it gets there, it's going to have the momentum to go on through. Gotcha. All right, so that puts a lot in perspective, guys. So you got, you know, spears early on, your atlatls, atlatl darts, varying amounts of, uh, you know, arrow types, bow types. And then, you know, I do have a modern bow here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this tribe? Sure. That's and a recurve, curve, right? This is still, yeah, this particular. This particular configuration makes a uh, recurve bow, uh, just very simply. This is a Tribe X3 riser from Tribe Archery. This set of limbs is a set of Black Max recurve limbs that's provided by Trad Tech, which is Lancaster Archery in Pennsylvania. And the unique thing about this system is, and I think it's okay to just show it real quick, And while he's taking that bow apart, guys, the arrows here that we're going to show you in a moment, they're definitely modern arrows, <coughs> modern broadheads. Uh, so there have been, obviously, technology changes to, to arrowheads, too. We'll get to that right. in a moment. The biggest thing with this system is a new takedown bow system. It's called the ILF system, which is International Limb Fit. It allows any manufacturer's limbs to go on any other manufacturer's riser. It allows you to make a long bow or a recurve. It allows you to have heavyweight limbs and lightweight limbs, any combination you want. And this is basically just a spring-loaded button, goes in a slot, caught under your limb bolt. It just snaps together. So the simplicity and beauty of a primitive weapon, but with the modularity 
of a modern weapon. So that that's really the beauty of that, guys. And Correct. this particular bow, I'm going to be buying from Scott. He actually sells a few of these. So this bow caught my eye, and it's just an awesome setup. Um, it is. You know, the <clears throat> interesting thing, what sold me on it, you know, a lot of us modern gun guys, we like the modularity of, say, like AR-15s, where we can just bolt on any random thing we sure. want on the gun. Uh, the nice thing about this bow is that if I want to get some 25 pound draw limbs for my wife who, you know, may not be able to full pull back a 40 or 45 pound bow, we can have just, you know, one setup, change the limbs out and bam, Correct. she's got a way she can practice and it just gives a lot of modularity there to suit different, different purposes. Right. And it's, a, it's an economical way to get two bows out of one. And uh, it is worth pointing out, there's a lot of crossover right now. There's a lot of compound guys that are looking into traditional archery. The neat thing about the Tribe Risers, they've got two. They've got a Halo and the X3. That is very reminiscent of what a compound riser feels like and looks like. They got the limb bolts to work with. So it's a good crossover. Instead of going with a hardcore wooden traditional bow, sure. that kind of fills that niche really well. And just, just to take a moment, uh, the limb bolts are not holding the limbs on. Those limb bolts are creating a cantilever effect, which is allowing you, for you guys that really are into this, you can adjust your tiller. You can have positive, negative, or equal tiller, depending on you're shooting three fingers under or split fingers. And uh, it allows you to manipulate your draw weight about three pounds. So that if you're really hardcore about tuning these carbon arrows or whatever, you can really fine tune your situation with that system. You know, now somebody that, is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a layman when it comes to archery. I'm trying to learn more and that's really the spirit of this video is I want to kind of take you guys on this learning experience along with me here. Um, you know, I, and I read magazines and stuff and I see stuff that's in hunting magazines and you always see these crazy modern arrowhead designs that look Correct absolutely wicked like there's some that have these these things that fold out and cut and they they, they kind of they move and trap when they enter the animal right. and they're they're just uber modern uh what's this style of broadhead here you know from my perspective as a as a non-archery kind of guy seems very simple and traditional it is and this this is a modern manufactured broadhead but it harkens back to the 30s and 40s when modern manufacturer was able to mass produce steel heads sure and to give credit where credit is due uh, bill dunn from grizzly broadheads manufactures these heads and as an endorsement when failure is not an option i'm using a grizzly broadhead so you and, killed a lot of critters with these things yes absolutely uh, just as a point of reference and and i'll point out quickly you've referred to me as an expert i don't look at it that way I feel that I am a perpetual student. I'm always learning, okay? And I, I've, I've told you before, my way works for me. Might not be the right way, might not be the best way, but it's a way that puts game on the tailgate. I completely agree with you. So now, that's the way I, I go with it. There's a lot of folks on YouTube that think I'm an expert about a lot of things, but you know, the, the weird thing is, is that when, when someone is considered a, a, a sort of resident expert, I mean, that can even come down to like our, our local neighbors, our friends at church or, or whatever we're doing in everyday life. If you run into somebody that knows more, a lot more than you about a given subject, well, guess what? They might as well be an expert. So it's never okay. a bad idea mm -hmm. to pick someone's brain about something. Right. Always keep an open mind and learn things when you can. So, But back to the task at hand, yes, absolutely. there's something very significant about these arrowheads, these broadheads. They are a single beveled head. So this, this edge on this is just like your butter knife in the kitchen. Your butter knife only has an ang or a bevel on one side. So when you shove that down through a hard piece of butter, it walks. You can't make it go straight, it curves. Well, these single bevels on opposing sides, by force of the geometry of the head, it has to twist. Slow or fast, the mechanical advantage of this, it's got to twist. So what that does, in my experience, uh, as a point of reference, I've shot, I've shot five hogs since the first year with this, with this gear. And you hit a shoulder blade or hit a good bone, instead of the point just wedging in that bone and wedging to a stop, it actually twists and fractures that bone unless the shaft pass on through. 
So the two heads that I use for everything is this single beveled Grizzly broadhead. And Bill came out with a three bladed that he calls the Instinct last year. And uh, I was fortunate enough to shoot the prototypes for him. I shot a 287 pound bore with this head. Complete penetration, quick recovery, awesome heads. They're made out of 1075 high carbon steel. And what we were referencing with this not being the modern head with multiple blades and things that move, they're fantastic heads. But the thing about these heads are, they are going to last. They're not gonna break. They're not gonna fail you. You can resharpen them and use them over and over and over again. I literally have grizzly broadheads that are 20 years old that I probably shot 10 deer with the same head. So definitely not disposable, whereby no. some of those uber modern ones I was discussing might be something that you're probably going to ruin it. You're going to kill, yeah. kill your game, but you're going to ruin the, the head and have to replace it. They're sturdy, they're effective, but they have their limitations in that respect. And, and one thing you were talking about, we're talking about people wanting to like harken back to days of old. We live in uncertain times. And we truly do have a lot of people with the mindset of if we have a societal collapse and things co go back to the way they were, are we ready to be the way it was? And yeah, so that, take, that, that kind of takes the video into a completely different animal there because, didn't you Didn't know, mean we, to throw you for a loop, oh, yeah. but, but that's where people's mindsets are and that's why people are calling me and wanting to know about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, that that's a multiple hour discussion that we could have about, you know, the, the prepper mindset and being well prepared and being, you know, well versed in, in, in things like this. But uh, so we got from the spear to the atlatl to the archery aspect, you know, basically increasing power, range, repeatable accuracy by improving the quality of the arrows they use, the quality of the bows they made. You've also got hand tools and implements like that. And one thing we were discussing earlier, I think is important to mention, you know, these are a couple of throwing tomahawks that he brought down, a couple of throwing knives. Now a knife is a knife and a tomahawk is a tomahawk, but you know, back in the early days, you know, a tomahawk might be extremely ornate. You know, they might have had some time to kill and made a just nice, beautiful tomahawk. And the thing that we were talking about that I think is important to mention is that weaponry back then was looked at in a, in a much different standpoint than what it is now, you know. It, a, a, a warrior going to fight a battle, his bow is his bow. His arrows are his arrows. Now granted, maybe some slightly different techniques, some slightly different arrows for fighting humans versus killing game or different position, he locates the knock or whatever, but you would just take your bow. Your bow was your bow. The right. same bow you killed your food with and defended your family and fended for your family would be the same bow you would grab and go fight. You didn't have equipment for recreation and equipment for duty. Right. Your bow was your bow. Right, and, and likewise, a quality tomahawk or a quality knife. Uh, now, you know, metal and steel and things like that is something that Europeans brought. Right, this trade. was brought over as trade items, brought over yeah. So with that being said, this is, uh, you know, early on the Indians would have been using bone or stone to make stone. war clubs out of. Absolutely. Now for cutting purposes, uh, before, you know, they had steel knives or anything like that, they would use, I guess, bone knives. Would they stone. take and sharpen stone? Stone knives. Okay. Stone, flint or chert that was napped okay. or else green stone that was ground. Almost like glass. Exactly. A a green, green, typically, green stone was ground to make an adze, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which would work as an axe. Okay, so basically mm -hmm. things like obsidian, stone, bone, flint, Correct. rock, all of those things gave way to eventually the age of steel. And then once steel was developed, that kind of was a game changer, you know, in the big scheme of things. Absolutely. You know, and, and we were talking about this earlier, but I want to make sure the, you know, subscribers, you know, get an sure. idea here. You know, these knives are intended for throwing, and we're gonna demonstrate that for you in the video here. Uh, and these tomahawks are intended for throwing. But from a combat situation, if an Indian warrior wasn't armed with a bow, he would be armed with a knife and a tomahawk more than likely. So he would, you know, have or, his- Or a long hunter, a European, same way. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, ha this this type of situation, right? right. You know, a knife and a, and a tomahawk to be able to, you know, stop blows, in part blows. Sure. So pretty interesting science there to all that. And uh, 
I really appreciate you taking time to talk with us about this, and I hope you guys found this video to be informative because I, I've, I've learned a lot after spending a little bit of time in the woods with Scott here and learning a little bit. It, it's so amazing the amount of history and diversity amongst all the different cultures of the world in primitive weaponry. It, it really is literally a science all on its own. If you study primitive weaponry to the gills, you'll find that it, it is a lengthy subject. It is. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is just scratching the surface and it's it's really just the modern renderings that I allow the public to handle is what okay. it is. I got and you. It's like I wanted to bring pretty stuff, and you said, no, I want the stuff you use every day. Exactly. And it's, it's the way it looks is the way it looks, and it, it's used every day. That's awesome. Yeah. One thing that I want to, you know, kind of leave this video with here, and, and this is just something I'm, I'm thought of just now, but a good way to look at it is modern weaponry guys, you know, we're talking guns, you know, black powder, is a very new technology compared to the entire existence of mankind. And guys, for a long, long time, mankind relied on what you see on this table. Before guns were around, before black powder was around, before those newer technology advancements were made, this is what we had for years. So the amount of time in human history that these weapons encompass is way greater than anything we have from a newer technology Correct. standpoint. Absolutely, thousands of years. Absolutely. Scott, I appreciate you taking your time to come down, hang out with us for today. Uh, I check enjoyed out, every minute of it, man. Absolutely. Check out Whack Outdoors. He's got a YouTube channel, and guys, it's a lot of hunting stuff, primitive stuff. You'll love it. Check him out. Uh, we're gonna have more videos on the way. We've uh, been filming here for a few days, trying to come up with some really fun things for you. We hope you enjoyed today's video. We hope you learned something. Be sure to subscribe, rate, comment. Is there something we left out that you would have wanted to see on this table? Uh, is there something we need to rehash and do at a later date? Let me know and we will certainly try to accommodate it. Uh, thanks guys for watching. We'll catch you next time.